Welcome to the Science of Success with your host, Matt Bodner. Welcome to the Science of Success. I'm your host, Matt Bodner. I'm an entrepreneur and investor in Nashville, Tennessee, and I'm obsessed with the mindset of success and the psychology of performance. I've read hundreds of books, conducted countless hours of research and study, and I'm going to take you on a journey into the human mind and what makes peak performers tick, with a focus on always having our discussions rooted in psychological research and scientific fact, not opinion. In this episode, we discuss how to create evil in a research laboratory. What makes people turn evil? We examine the definition of heroism, dig into the famous Stanford prison experiment, explore time paradoxes, and much more with the legendary Dr. Philip Zimbardo. Because the science of success has spread across the globe with more than 525,000 downloads, listeners in over 100 countries, hitting number one new and noteworthy, and much more, I give away something awesome to my listeners every single month. This month, I'm giving away a $100 Amazon gift card to one lucky listener. All you have to do to be entered to win is to text the word SMARTER, that's S-M-A-R-T-E-R, to the number 44222. Again, just text the word SMARTER to the number 44222 to be entered to win. And if you want to get 10, yes, 10 extra entries into the giveaway, all you have to do is leave a positive review on iTunes and email me a screenshot of that review to matt at scienceofsuccess.co. That's M-A-T-T at scienceofsuccess.co. In our previous episode, we discussed the intersection between neuroscience and game theory, asked whether you're smarter than a chimpanzee, examined how simple mental judgments can be massively wrong, explained the basics of game theory, and dug deep into strategic thinking with Dr. Colin Kammerer. If you want to become a master strategist, listen to that episode. Today, we have a titan of psychology on the podcast, Dr. Philip Zimbardo. Dr. Z is an internationally recognized scholar, educator, researcher, and media personality, winning numerous awards and honors in each of these domains. He has been at Stanford University as a professor since 1968, where he conducted the famous Stanford Prison Experiment. His career is noted for giving psychology away to the public through his popular PBS TV series, Discovering Psychology, along with many texts and trade books among his 300 publications. He was recently president of the American Psychology Association. Dr. Z, welcome to the Science of Success. I'm happy to be here, Matt, and happy to share some ideas with your listeners. Well, we're so excited to have you on here. Um, well, I know we're a little bit time constrained today, so let's just jump right in. Um, starting with kind of the idea of the psychology of evil, tell me about what makes people go wrong? What makes people turn evil? Well, I've been studying evil in a curious way by creating it in research laboratories. I was interested in this topic since I was a little kid. I grew up in poverty in the ghetto in the South Bronx of New York. And if you grow up in any ghetto, there are always men, there's always men, who are there, evil men, to corrupt kids, getting them to do criminal things for for money, stealing, selling drugs, taking drugs, getting girls to sell their bodies for money. Um, And some of my friends gave into that temptation and other kids didn't. So evil, again, as as we know from the Bible, is all about giving in or resisting temptation. And so as a kid, I was curious as to what's the difference between kids, you know, who gave into this temptation and end up doing bad things. Some of them went to jail and kids like me and other friends who didn't. Uh, My primitive uh, answer when I was seven years old was that maybe it had to do with having a strong mother who who had a moral compass saying, this is right, this is wrong, and also showed, you know, unconditional love. And then when I became a psychologist, I thought, well, it's not that simple uh, because there are three kinds of evil. There's evil, which is dispositional in people. That's namely bad apples. Uh, There are people who are psychopaths, who don't feel emotion, uh, who can hurt others with no remorse. We see this in a lot of the high school shooters. But then there's the evil of situations. That is, there's some situations that encourage, provoke, stimulate people to do bad things. And that's situational evil. And that's where this, my prison study comes in. And also the earliest study, I'll, I'll mention briefly to your list, is by Stanley Milgram about blind obedience to authority. But then we have to recognize a third kind of evil, which is systemic evil, namely that the evil created by legal, political, economic forces 
And this is the bad barrel makers. So it's bad apples, bad barrels, and bad barrel makers. So systemic evil is, you know, war, terrorism, uh, slave labor, um, sex trafficking. So there's many examples. of. So that's evil at the top. And that's the worst kind of evil because it's, it's, it's evil for, to make money. So is there a fixed line between good and evil or is it permeable? That's a really good question. It, it's very permeable and it varies historically. It varies, you know, with different cultures and it's, it's culturally relevant. So that if you are a suicide bomber uh, in the Mideast, in Palestine, and your job is to blow up innocent women and children, and with the assumption that you will then be a hero, you'll be sitting at the right hand of Allah. Well, that's that's one definition of, of hero, but you are a villain to the opposition. So, so really, there has to be a higher order definition. It can't be localized. It can't be local hero. Uh, so there really has to be an international sense that nothing that destroys human life except in a military battle of soldiers against soldiers can qualify as heroism. So how would you how would you define evil or how would you define heroism? Okay, well, heroism is easier. Uh, heroism is acting to help others in need and or acting to support a moral cause by standing up, speaking out, taking action, doing so aware that there could be a risk and a personal cost. Uh, and so that's how evil, that's how heroism differs from altruism. In altruism, there's no personal cost. I give money to a charity. I, I give blood to a, a blood bank. So it's really not a cause. So that heroism involves a knowing risk cause. In the extreme, it's it's loss of life or limb. But for whistleblowers, for example, it's often loss of your job or loss of promotion. Uh, evil is behaving in ways that violate human dignity that degrade, diminish the quality of life for other people uh, in various ways. One of the landmark findings of the Stanford Prison Experiment was the power of institutions to impact human behavior. Tell me a little bit more about that. Well, as I said earlier, in the mid-60s, Stanley Milgram, when he was a young professor at Yale University, did the really dramatic studies on obedience to authority in which he had he tested a 1,000 people over a number of years, mostly men, but he also showed it's true with women, who were put in a situation where they believed they were acting as teachers to help their student improve by punishing your student when he made errors. And the punishment was by uh, delivering electric shocks on a, um, a prearranged schedule on a big electric stimulator. And it started at 15 volts and it increased by 15 volts along 30 switches. And when it got to in the hundreds, the student who was actually a confederate in another room, meaning working with working with the experiment, began to scream and yell. And as it got worse and worse, he screamed louder and louder and said, said beg to let stop it. And in every case, the subjects, the teachers, the, the people role-playing teachers, complained, they, they dissented, but the, but the experiment acting as the ultimate authority, the white lab coat, kept putting pressure on them to keep going. And the question is, would you go up to 450 volts of electric shock uh, to another person at the command of an authority? When this study was presented to 40 psychiatrists at the Yale Medical School, their answer was only 1% would do that because that's psychopathic behavior. And in fact, what Milgram found was two of every three American citizens in his research went all the way. So that was that was shocking and startling. But in my analysis, it's very rare somebody tells you to do a bad thing other than the evil guys in the Bronx. Usually you're playing a role. You're in a situation. You see what, what other people are doing. And then there's always semantic distortion. That is, nobody does evil. People are doing good. So again, if you're with ISIS, uh, you're doing the Lord's work, or you're doing you're doing Allah's, um, you're doing what 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 they believe the Quran says. So what I wanted to do in creating the Stanford Prison Study is to ask the question: What happens when you put only good people in a really bad situation, namely a simulated prison, which which simulates 
uh, the psychology of, of American prisons with power and dominance and demeaning, making prisons feel powerless and helpless. You know, would the goodness of the people change the badness of the situation? Or does such powerful situations even come to corrupt good people? And sadly, the answer was humanity zero, evil one. And we lost, we lost that battle because almost everyone in my study, and these were college students from all over the United States, recruited by an ad in the Palo Alto newspaper, uh, wanted college students for study of prison life to last up to two weeks. And 75 people answered the ad. We interviewed them, gave them personality tests. We picked two dozen, the most normal, healthy, that's really important, and, and smart, educated college students. And we randomly assigned them by a flip of the coin, half would be guards, half would be prisoners. And then we began our experiment. And what happened was initially on day one, nothing. Remember, it's 1971. Students are anti-war activists. Students are civil rights activists. Students hate the police because policemen came on many college campuses when students were protesting against the war in Vietnam. So nobody wanted to be a guard. And that's really important. But they're in the guard uniform. They have the role. They have to do it. But what happened was on day two, the prisoners revolted. That is, they didn't want to be dehumanized. The prisoners had smocks on with, instead of the name, they, they, had a, they only became a number, as happens in, in, in prisons. Um, and then what the guards did was call in all the, all the guards on all the ships. There were three guards on each of three eight-hour ships and standby guards. And they broke down the doors that the prisoners had barricaded. And at that point, they said, these are dangerous prisoners. And suddenly everything changed. Now the guards have to demonstrate to the prisoners that they have power and the prisoners have none. And every day thereafter, they ramped up the abuse, the degradation. And in 36 hours, the first prisoner had an emotional breakdown in an experiment, no experiment. Uh, and each day thereafter, another prisoner broke down. So we were going to end this. We were going to the study was going to go for two weeks, but I ended it after six days because it was out of control. We had proved our point. Evil situations can corrupt the best and brightest of us. That's fascinating, and I know that the, that experiment's a landmark study in psychology. You know, now it's it's a Hollywood movie. It's a very good Hollywood movie that just opened last year. I mean, this year. It was premiered at Sundance in 2015, last year, and it, it won number many awards for the best best science into film, best editing, best screenplay, and brilliant acting by two dozen young young actors. And uh, and the guy who played me, Billy Crudup, uh, he he was in the movie Almost Famous, and he's he's a very good rendition of me, a, a little more handsome, but but otherwise a good a good sub. Well, that's great. We'll definitely include in the show notes uh, a link to that movie so everybody can check it out. Yeah, there's a great, it's actually a great two minute trailer. Perfect. Well, we'll link all that stuff up in the show notes. So tell me about looking more, kind of zooming out at the systemic causes of evil. What are some of the social processes that grease, I think, as you call it, the slippery slope of evil? There's much research, not only by me, by many other people, which outline what are the specific social psychological processes that can make somebody step across that line between good and evil. Um, and there's research that shows that the major it's the majority of people who can be seduced, can be corrupted. It's really the minority who are able to resist the group pressure. So uh, any situation you're in where the situation makes you feel anonymous, nobody knows who you are, and really nobody cares to know, makes it easier for you to do evil if that's a possibility, uh, to cheat, to lie, to steal. Uh, diffusion of responsibility. Uh, if you're in a group and the usual personal responsibility that you feel for your action now gets diffused, gets spread thinly. So now the group begins, to, for example, not help somebody in distress. And normally you would be a good Samaritan, but now your diffusion responsibility is diffused and you don't help. There are many, many, many uh, situations. I, and as I said, it's anonymity, diffusion, responsibility, uh, moral disengagement. There are also times when we are very moral, but in a particular situation, we say, well, this is different. And so uh, we can suspend our usual sense of morality or conscience. And again, being in a group where the group norm is either to do nothing or to do things which favor your group against some other group. But it's dehumanization is, for me, the most extreme, namely thinking about it. So that's what we say. It's in the imagination. Thinking about someone else 
or some other group as less than human, as vermin, as animals, as worthless. Once you have that thought in mind, once you put a label on other people, then there's no limit to what what you can do. Uh, Now, I think sadly we're seeing this recently in all the police shootings of black men throughout the country where, you know, deep down, it's a theory, it's a threat. Deep down, they believe that black men are, I mean, they, many people in society and police especially, uh, who are who are weaponized, believe that black men pose a danger. Okay, So wh- when any black man is in a situation where there's any ambiguity, that the policeman will err in the direction of assuming something negative, assuming the person is armed, assuming the person will take action against them. And therefore, what, th- what they are seeing is they are defending their life by shooting first. And in many cases, the black man, the African-American man or boy had no weapon, uh, was innocent, except he was not innocent of, of being black uh, in, in the eyes of the white policeman. So we've touched on evil and, and how some you know, a situation or social processes can turn somebody, a normal, healthy, smart person into someone that's capable of evil, especially in the context of police shootings, which you're just referencing uh, I know something that's incredibly important to you and now is a big focus is is the psychology of heroism and the idea of the heroic imagination. Tell me a little bit about that. Yes. Well, let me let me help with that transition is that, you know, after I did the Stanford Prison Study way back in 1971, I wrote a few articles. I never wrote a book about it because for me, it was just a nice demonstration of the power of situations. And I moved on. Uh, I began to study shyness as a self-imposed psychological prison. Nobody had studied shyness in adolescents or adults before I did in 1972. Then I began to study the psychology of time perspective because in that week, all our sense of time got distorted because for the prisoners and then for me and my staff of graduate students, Craig Haney, Kurt Banks, David Jaffe, um, each eight-hour guard shift began to feel like a full day. And in the prison, in our prison, uh, there were no clocks, there were no watches, there was no daylight or nightlight. Um, and so I began to study how people live in different time zones of past, present, and future. And it was only after I got involved in defending an American prison guard in Abu Ghraib prison scandal that I then decided to write a book about it. And I wrote a book called The Lucifer Effect, Understanding How Good People Turn Evil. It's become a classic. It's translated now in 25 different languages. So I I would put that on uh, the reading list of your listeners. But the other thing, in chapter 16, I raise for the first time the question of everyday heroes. I say that in all the the evil situation, Abu Ghraib, in Stanford study, in the Milgram study, uh, and then I outline all of the research uh, done on, on psychology of evil and conformity, there's always a minority, 5%, 10%, 20 never more than 30, who resist the power of the situation. And I raise the question, I raise the issue, maybe we can think of them as heroes, not, tr- not traditional heroes, not military heroes who, who are willing to die in, the ba- in battle to save their buddies. But these are people who, in any given situation, are able to step back, identify what's happening, and make a decision not to go along with the group. And, and they're willing to risk being ostracized or, or uh, dismissed from the group. And so that's the first time I raised the whole the question about the nature of heroism. And shortly after, I gave a TED Talk in 2008, uh, a TED Talk on my journey from evil to uh, heroism. And many people came up afterwards, um, including Pierre Omidyar, the guy who started eBay. And he said, you know, you have to start create a nonprofit foundation to study this concept of everyday heroism. It's really new. Nobody's ever thought about it. And so I did. So since 2008, I have a nonprofit organization in San Francisco called The Heroic Imagination Project, short HIP, H-I-P. Because the idea is it all starts in the mind, in the human imagination, thinking of yourself as evil. Think of yourself as someone who is willing to stand up, 
stand out, speak out, take action in all the challenging situations in your life, in your family, in your school, in your work, in your community, and ultimately in your nation. Uh, and so we started doing research. There was eight years ago, there was almost no research on heroism, uh, which is really curious. In fact, the word hero and heroism does not exist in any psychology textbook. It does not exist in the positive psychology manual because it's not a human virtue, it's a civic action. Uh, and so this was this is startling, still is. So we began to do research and then I developed uh, with my education team a series of educational lessons or modules, each organized around a social psychological theme like uh, transforming passive bystanders into active heroes, transforming a fixed static mindset into a dynamic growth mindset, uh, transforming uh, prejudice and discrimination into understanding and acceptance. So we developed six of these lessons in great detail, great length. And what's exciting about them is, uh, and really educate, revolution education, they're all organized around provocative videos. So teachers then don't give lectures at all. We give teachers a script. Teachers are like athletic coaches. The students are really their team. And the goal is bring out the best in each of your team members. And now students work in pairs, ideally a boy and a girl as a team. So when the teacher asks a question, it's not that everybody raises their hand to answer. It's that each team talks about how they would respond. Sometimes they write down their answer. Sometimes the teacher calls on the team uh, to do this. And each lesson goes two to three hours and the feedback is it's exciting for the teachers, exciting for students. But the two most important things is understanding these principles of social psychology and how they can be put into action. And that means that we are training every student to be a potential social change agent, to use knowledge to make the world better, not simply to make you smarter. Uh, and this is the feedback we're getting around the world. So our program is in Hungary, in Poland, in Italy, um, in Bali, in, in uh, Geelong, Australia, uh, in Flint, Michigan, and many community colleges in Oregon and in uh, Southern California. And we hope to spread it even further. So for someone that's listening to this podcast right now, uh, what would be a way that they could apply the knowledge of psychology to make themselves better? Well, that's, that's you can go on our website, www.heroicimagination.com, and I think we have some advice, some recommendations. Uh, reading the looser effect would also be a start. Uh, but it's, unfortunately, we d I, really want to, I really want to build a volunteer core, and uh, I'm good at almost everything except raising money. I have not been able to raise money. I give, I give a huge amount of money to my hero project, and I, I physically, I do the training. So, so part of our model is in order to deliver these lessons, you license them for a fee for, let's say, for three years, either a school, a city, or even a whole nation. And then I have been doing most of the training. I go to Budapest. I go to Warsaw. I go to uh, Bali. Uh, but I'm, I'm now 83 years old, and I'm not as mobile as I used to be. Uh, so I have to raise money in order to build out our team, in order to get volunteers to learn, to be trained, uh, to deliver this, this material. Um, but I, I think if, if they're interested in being involved, I think it's just if you put admin, A-D-M-I-N, at heroicimagination.com, um, my assistant will try to answer them and see how, how we could create a, a volunteer corps. That's very exciting. Well, you, you touched on this in the backstory behind how you got involved with creating the Heroic Imagination Project. Tell me a little bit about uh, the idea of time paradoxes and the different time zones that people live in. Yeah. So, as I said, in between the Stanford Prison Study and Creating Heroes, I stopped out and I started on this, trying to understand how is it that people live in different time zones and are typically totally unaware that they do. And here again, it started with very personal. Uh, my father, who was a brilliant man, who ne never was, never had no education, uh, second generation Sicilian, was a total, what we call present hedonist. He lived for the present moment. Uh, he was a musician. Uh, he was a party guy. He was, he loved to dance. He loved to gamble. 
And this was great when he was single, but it's not great when he has a family of, of four, to, uh, four kids and, and a wife to take care of. But he didn't care. He was always happy. He, w- he was out of work often. We were on, on home relief, they used to call in those days. And he used to get me crazy because I was, you know, I, I realized the only way to get out of poverty is by planning, by ha- having a program, by having an agenda to do things constructively. And he lived for the moment. He lived for the day. Um, so an amazing example is that without any education at all, he made a television set from a wiring diagram in 1947. Television was invented when? 1946, a year before. He learned how to do wiring. I mean, he built it himself, not not just read the plans. Uh, he, he learned wiring. He, he learned ha- how to read schematics from a Puerto Rican radio store man who had a radio store in the tenement building we lived in. And he built a set in 1947. I remember charging my friends, I think, 25 cents to watch the World Series. I think it was Yankees against the Dodgers. And everybody said, we want one. I said, Dad, this is our break. You know, we'll help you. Everybody, it's a new thing. In fact, even more brilliantly, equally brilliant. You know, they only had little eight-inch screens. So he got a parabolic mirror, a huge mirror, so that you could uh, expand the, uh, the view of the, of the screen. My father said, what? He said, no, I only did one. It was a challenge. I met it. That's it. I don't want to, I don't want to bother doing more. So here's a case where you're poor. You have an invention that everybody wants. You can make money on it. I'm, I'm pressing because I'm now totally future oriented and he's resisting because he lives in the moment. So, so that really started me always thinking as a kid and later on, how is it that people can have such different time zones and not, not, and be unaware of the other. So, I developed a scale called the Zimbardo Time Perspective Inventory, ZTPI, uh, and, which was published. And it's the, it's the most widely used scale that measures differences in time perspective. Then I wrote a book called The Time Paradox. And if your listeners go on the web, www.thetimeparadox.com, there is a scale. And if they take it, it scores it immediately. And it tells you which of the five time zones are you in? Are you future oriented, like I was, am? Are you a present hedonist? Uh, or do you live in the past? Do you live in a positive past or a negative past? Uh, are you a present fatalist? Do you believe that it doesn't pay to plan the future? Nothing works out. Fate is against you. So these are five of the scales that we have developed. And since then, again, it's being translated in dozens of languages around the world. And people using it in research and education, even in finance, are finding enormous benefits of using that. And lastly, uh, for those in your audience who are interested in, in therapy, I wrote a book called The Time Cure, where we used the ideas in The Time Paradox as a way to treat people with PTSD, veterans, uh, women who have been um, sexually abused, people who have been in uh, natural disasters or fatal car accidents. Uh, and we show how uh, a very simple didactic treatment uh, literally can cure PTSD. Uh, and the book is called The Time Cure. So there's a lot of, lot of reading for your, for your listeners. That's great. We, we love to have lots of uh, resources for people to dig in who want to do homework after the show and learn a lot more. You know, one of the funny stories that I really like that you tell about time paradox is uh, the idea or the concept that the Sicilian dialect in Italy has no future tense. Can you tell that story? Yeah. So I'm Sicilian. I mean, my fa- I am Sicilian. My, I'm my grandmother's side, my grandfather's side. Uh, I'm third generation. My grandparents came here, oh, in, you know, around the turn of the century. Uh, and again, none of them were educated. And in general, one of the sad things about Sicily is people do not value education as much as they do in Asian countries, as much as the um, the Jewish people do. And the big problem has always been believing that you get what you want, not by being smart, but by having good connections. And this is the enduring curse of the mafia. There's also political connections, corruption. Um, and, and so this is what I've ha- always had to oppose. In fact, as a sidebar, I set up a foundation in Sicily in the, in, the, in the cities where my grandparents came from. And I have a colleague, Steve Lusso, who's the head of Seagate Technology, whose grandmother came from Corleone. My grandparents came from Camerata. So together we put in money, we raised money. And every year we give 20 scholarships for high school kids in both of those towns to go to Sicilian colleges. 
And we're changing, we're slowly changing the idea that it really matters what you know, even more than who you know. But one of the problems then in this in this culture where people live for the moment, that is, they live good food, good wine, lots of babies, good sex, um, you know, good lifestyle is really important, partying, dancing, that when I gave a talk recently, there was a poet in the audience who came up after, a man came up after and said, look, I'm a poet. I live with words. And it's not until I heard you talk that I realized that in Sicilian dialect, there is no term for the future. There's a term was, there's a term is, there's no will be. It doesn't exist. And I said, really? He said, and now I understand why things never get done because nobody ever plans for the future. And nobody ever makes a reservation uh, uh, for something that's going to happen more, more than a few hours in the future. So, so I thought this was very, very funny. But, but really, um, it's funny on one side, but it also means it limits the growth, educational growth, but also the uh, economic growth of a, a nation. So how do conflicts derive from differences in people's time perspectives? If you don't understand that somebody else is, lives in a different time zone, you make misattributions. Um, so the easy attribution of my father was he's lazy, you know, and, and his attribution of me could have been uh, he's excessive. He's a, a nerd. He's a, he, does, he only cares about money. So, again, in every family, people live in different time zones. And one of the things we argue is it's really important for the whole family to take take our time scale test, as I said online, and then begin to talk. It's a great conversation, thing. you know, knowing what your time zone is, what other people's time. And then we also tell you what what is ideal. So an ideal balanced time zone, uh, dot time profile is to be moderately high on future, not excessively high because then you become a workaholic but high on past positive, meaning when you think about the past, you, you bring up all the good memories, all the good things that happen. And then to be moderate on present hedonism, meaning but you select things that are pleasurable as a reward for when you succeed uh, in something on your to-do list. But past negative and present fatalism always has to be low uh, because those are, they, they distract from the human, detract from the human condition. So a balanced time perspective, and lots of people now are using that as the core to say uh, high past positive, moderately high future, and moderate present hedonism, and, and low on past negative, past present fatalism. That's what's called balanced time perspective, BTP. Uh, and there's now lots of research that shows people who have this balanced time perspective are happier, more successful in academically, more successful in business. And, and this is what we want to strive for. So how do we change our time perspective? Well, at this point, I'm going to tell you, you have to read the book. In The Time Paradox, we have a whole, whole chapters on if you want to be more present-oriented, this is what you have to do. If you want to be more future-oriented, this is what you have to do. Because right now, I am running out of time. I have a lecture to prepare uh, for tomorrow. Um, we're starting a Zimbardo College in China. And my China representative, Jenny Ma, is just flying in today from Shanghai for us to begin to plan courses uh, for our Zimbardo College in Shanghai. Perfect. Well, I know uh, I know you've got to go and you've got a, a ton of fascinating projects and initiatives out there, which we will have a very detailed show notes. Where we go through and list everything that Dr. Z listed from books to movies to TED Talks and things about the Heroic Imagination Project. So Dr. Z, uh, it's been an honor to have you on the Science of Success. And I just wanted to say thank you so much. Thank you. The other thing I just noticed, checking out on my TED Talk, 4,250,000 people have seen that in eight years. That's a staggering number. Four, five million, uh, five and a quarter million people have seen that, that 18 minute, 20 minute talk. It's pretty uh, amazing. It's, it's, For listeners who haven't, we'll link it in the show notes so you can check it out. But, uh, but again, Dr. Z, thank you so much. We've, uh, we've really enjoyed having you on here. Anytime. Take care. Be well. Ciao. Ciao. Thank you so much for listening to the science of success. Listeners like you are why we do this podcast. The emails and stories we receive from listeners around the globe bring us joy and fuel our mission to unleash human potential.
If you have a story, a comment, an idea, something you want to share, if you just want to say thank you, shoot me an email. I read and respond to every single email that I get from listeners. My email address is matt at scienceofsuccess.co. That's M-A-T-T at scienceofsuccess.co. I love hearing from listeners. The greatest compliment you can give us is a referral to a friend, either live or online. If you enjoyed this episode, please leave us an awesome review and subscribe on iTunes because that helps more and more people discover the science of success. Lastly, as a thank you to you for being awesome listeners, I'm giving away a $100 Amazon gift card. All you have to do to be entered to win is to text the word SMARTER, that's S-M-A-R-T-E-R, to the number 44222. Again, text the word SMARTER to the number 44222. Thanks again, and we'll see you on the next episode of The Science of Success.